It's a hot summer day at the Katabuki so and Yoshi is sweatily enduring the humid heat in his room. Downstairs, he can hear the yakai landlord collecting the monthly rent. Yoshi checks his wallet and sees that if he pays his rent today, he won't have any money left which means he has to withdraw. Since it's Sunday, that means paying the ATM fee. Thus, he decides to just pay the rent tomorrow and pretend that he's not in his room, just like any broke teenager would do. Unfortunately for him, the landlord is a yakai, and he starts spilling at the seams of the door, giving Yoshi a fright and earning him a lengthy lecture from his angry landlord. A month later, Hayes visited again from his trip to Australia. Hayes shows that he's truly the best boy as he once again arrives bearing a box full of gifts. Bakain asks how his vacation had been and Hayes narrates how he's been ordered by his sisters the whole month. First, she berated him for not getting first-class tickets, forced them to stay in a shadow-style cottage, dragged him to go skiing, go shopping, take a night cruise, and more. As gifts, Hayes gives a kind a pair of opal earrings. For Ririko's disembodied hand, he gives her a black opal ring. As for Curie, he has stuffed kangaroos, crocodiles, koalas, and emus, showering the little kid with gifts. Ishiki invites him to stay until summer vacation ends, which Hayes readily agrees to. Yoshi tries to protest since he has to work during the summer leaving Hayes all alone. But Hayes doesn't care and tells him that he'll just enjoy having lots of fun with Curie at home. As for Yoshi, he gives him an aboriginal art shirt, annoying Yoshi with the seemingly normal gift compared to the others. During dinner, Antiquary visits again and Yoshi introduces Hayes to him. Hayes offers to shake his hand but Antiquary quickly pulls him and asks him if he's interested in buying a unicorn horn. Thankfully, Yoshi puts a stop to it before any scamming takes place. Meanwhile, Akain enjoys the food that Hayes gifted them. Hayes compliments Antiquary's use of the chopstick and Antiquary narrates how he's been born in the East. Antiquary shares that he and Hayes seem to have a special connection and offers the unicorn horn to him once again. Yoshi has a bad feeling about these two when it seems that his feelings are correct since Hayes shockingly offers to buy it. Antiquary smiles since someone finally took him seriously, and the two debate upon the price. After a lengthy negotiation, they agree on a price of 60,000 yen with a bonus secret item. And so, Hayes obtains a new necklace while Antiquary explains that unicorn horns heal all illnesses and reflects curses. As for the bonus item, Antiquary hands Hayes a rare and uncensored picture of him with a unicorn. Later that night, Yoshi and Hayes are lying in bed with the sleeping Kiri between them talking about everything they did the past month. Hayes commends him for training so much, making Yoshi remember how he used to bottle up and refuse to admit his feelings and thoughts. But Hayes opened that door. Even if it's something Yoshi doesn't want to hear, Hayes explained it in a fair and accurate way for him to understand. Hayes wonders if Yoshi's third eye means his powers are growing but Yoshi laughs and narrates how it's kinda funny how it's given in the form of a headbutt. All of a sudden, Hayes demands that he gets the third eye and headbutts Yoshi, making him cry out in pain. All of their scuffles wake up Kiri, who Hayes quickly soothes pointing out how Mommy was being very loud. Later while going to the bathroom, Yoshi bumps into the landlord who was once again collecting rent. He remembers how he got reamed the last time he paid rent late but the landlord just ignores him. Puzzled, Yoshi goes back to his room but Hayes explains that he actually already paid the rent. Not only that, he paid for his food too. With that, he can be with Yoshi the whole summer with no worries. Meanwhile, Yoshi confusingly looks at his receipt, wondering why Hayes is so rich. Nevertheless, he just bows before his wealthy friend who paid for his rent and asks him to stay forever. The next day, Yoshi continues his morning training with Akain but Akain isn't satisfied with just the hose and basin of water anymore. She instead wants a waterfall. Yoshi laughs at her weird thoughts but Akain abruptly tells him that she's going to ask the landlord for a waterfall. The others agree with the suggestion and hope that they add the waterfall next to the hot springs. It turns out that the landlord can truly make one. Hayes jokes that maybe they should get a randomly generated dungeon for Yoshi to train in but Yoshi quickly turns the idea down. A few days later, Yoshi receives a call from Tashiro informing him that their homeroom teacher is sick so they're going to have a new teacher. Not only that, it's going to be a young man. After his call, Yoshi sees the landlord as white as a sheet, not at all its usual dark color. Fukase tells him to go to the hot springs and true to his word, the landlord really did finish building a brand new waterfall, as well as a night sky underground. The guys head to take a dip in the hot springs with the exhausted landlord in tow. Hayes, Yoshi, and Kiri join in but of course, it wouldn't be a party without Ririko's cooking and Mariko joining the bath. The next morning, Akain wears her swimsuit and joins Yoshi under the waterfall. 
they chant together building up their spiritual energy and then a quick dip in the hot springs after. Yoshi spends the rest of his summer eating watermelon with the others and before it ends, he visits his parents' graves to tell them of the wonderful and busy summer he had. Meanwhile, a new character arrives at their school. Before the semester starts, the three goddesses of fate scry the future and predict that Yoshi would have a new encounter. And just as they predicted, Yoshi not only has one new teacher at school but two. The first of them is their new homeroom teacher, a dashing young man. The other is Miura's replacement, a young female teacher named Naoki. Back in their classroom, everyone is buzzing about their new teachers. When their homeroom teacher arrives and introduces himself as Mr. Chayaki, all the girls in the class swoon. Tashiro even unabashedly asks him if he's single. Without missing a beat, Mr. Chayaki replies that indeed he is and his family is wealthy. But if they want to do anything with him, they have to graduate first. The girls start barraging him with questions, asking where he lives, what sport he does, and what his ideal girl is. Mr. Chayaki responds to them all, and Yoshi observes that he's easy to get along with. He also doesn't give out harsh punishments, only confiscating the magazine of one of their classmates. All in all, Mr. Chayaki reminds Yoshi of Fukase, someone who's popular, rough, and gutsy. During English class, their whole class is wowed by their new and knowledgeable English teacher, Ms. Aoki. Unlike Mr. Chayaki, she seems really prim and proper. During lunch, the girls all giddily wonder if they should go to Mr. Chayaki for guidance counseling about their problems. Yoshi asks them why not to Ms. Aoki who seems nice too but Tashiro points out that it seems awkward to say anything weird to her. Yoshi agrees with them since Ms. Aoki seems to have an air of serenity around her. After class, Fool was glad that the Norn's prediction was spot on and that Yoshi truly met some new people. Not only that, Ms. Aoki's aura seemed especially pure. Yoshi was surprised to hear this since Fool always complains about how humans' auras are tainted. Fool explains that human auras are always wavering, warped by various desires and emotions. But those who have undergone spiritual training, for example Ryu, lack that fluctuation. It's the aura unique to one who focuses each day on mastering their own craft. Yoshi wonders if this means that Ms. Aoki is a good person but Fool clarifies that this just means Ms. Aoki is a focused individual. The next day, Tashiro and Yoshi are stopped in the hallway by Mr. Chayaki who proceeds to ask Yoshi if he's okay. He checks Yoshi's shoulders and arms while asking him if he needs to visit his place since he learned that Yoshi lives all alone. As a teacher, he can't neglect a good student. He checks Yoshi's ear and even his collar, weirding Yoshi out who assures him that he's fine. After Mr. Chayaki leaves, Tashiro gets jealous of Yoshi because Mr. Chayaki didn't even speak to her at all. During their club period, the English Conversation Club has a new member of a spectacled girl named Yamamoto. They then discuss their next club project, with a lot of members suggesting they just do what they did last year and dub an anime movie into English. The friendly Tashiro tries to start a conversation with Yamamoto, but Yamamoto sighs and asks her if she speaks English at all. As the English Conversation Club, she assumed they would speak English the whole time. Yoshi sees that she has a book with her so she asks what kind of books she likes so Yamamoto narrates how she likes the Russian author, Chekhov. Yoshi shares that he actually just reads samurai novels and Tashiro reads magazines. Hearing their conversation makes Yamamoto sigh in disappointment. As their club meeting continues, Yamamoto asks them why they should dub an anime and not just a normal movie. As high schoolers, they shouldn't be watching anime which is for kids. This irks Tashiro and she's about to argue with Yamamoto but the club president calms her down and asks Yamamoto for a suggested movie. Yamamoto proposes that they dub a movie by Truffout. Everyone starts to wonder if she's talking about the mushroom called Truffles, making Yamamoto sigh in exasperation once again. After their club meeting, Yamamoto quickly exits the room and everyone starts talking about how troublesome she is. Yoshi tells them that Truffaut is actually a French director, so Yamamoto's suggestion still makes sense. Back at home, Yoshi shares the troubles they have with their new club member. However, the adult has a different conclusion. They believe that Yamamoto might have a complex. Russian literature and Truffaut's movies focus on adult-oriented topics that can only be learned through experience that comes from growing up. They are both highly regarded and artistic and if someone says they like them, they might want to look smart. Yoshi asks them if this might be the case but Ishiki suggests that maybe Yamamoto herself just thinks she likes them. She might just be lying to herself. Nevertheless, they all advise Yoshi to be careful with her. The next day, Yamamoto was the first person in their club room. 
They all start having small talk appreciating Yoshi's delicious meals and they try to include Yamamoto in the conversation but Yamamoto just keeps correcting their English grammar and pointing out their mistakes in word usage. Tashiro starts arguing with her again and Yoshi ends up intervening between the two. Yoshi's offhand mediation makes Yamamoto think that she's being ignored and she storms off the room. Later that night, Yoshi vents all his frustrations to Hase. At school, their club activities push forward with dubbing the anime but Yamamoto stops coming to their meetings. Fool speaks out and urges Yoshi to use them to find out more about Yamamoto, but Yoshi just stuffs him back in his pocket. Outside, Yamamoto walks away under the pouring rain and glares at their club room. In England, Hase is gazing at the moon, wondering if he and Yoshi are doing the same thing looking at the moon and thinking of each other. Of course, this wouldn't happen because it's currently 5 a.m. in Japan, and Yoshi's in his daily morning training. Unlike the first time he trained under the waterfall, Yoshi's mind eye can now see different things. A transparent bird, a man in black, or bunnies on the moon. During breakfast, Yoshi shares his visions earlier that morning and Ishiki explains that bunnies in the moon are actually a worldwide concept representing a bountiful harvest. Ancient Chinese claimed that clams live on the moon, then toads, and lastly bunnies. The bunnies are said to make rice cakes on the moon, said to grant immortality. Moons have always been associated with immortality. Both the Indian god of the moon Soma and Princess Kaguya is said to have a medicine granting immortality called Amrita. To the ancient people, the moon was where the gods lived and the people who lived there were immortal. All of a sudden, they hear a carriage delivering some stuff, and a basket full of fresh fruits and fishes were delivered to the apartment. With that, Ishiki announced that they'll be having a moon viewing party and Yoshi would make the machai. At school, Yoshi informs Tashiro and the others that he won't be able to attend club activities for the day because of their moon viewing party at home. Outside, Yamamoto overhears them and grits her teeth in annoyance with them. Ms. Aoki sees her and wants to help. Back at the apartment, Yoshi and the gang have a healthy meal with fresh fish and rice while Akain announces that they'll be having the moon viewing party by the waterfall. She had invited patients from the Tsukinoki Hospital where she worked. It's a yakai hospital for yakai that are hurt, physically or spiritually. Normal people usually never go there and most that do are homeless or elderly with no relatives. 100% of these people meet their ends at Tsukinoki Hospital. Akain explains that they're actually fine with that because their staff are all spiritualists or not human at all. Thus, they can handle any patient. They can take care of them without ever getting tired. The elderly who have fallen in status, lost their relatives or home, come to the hospital to await death. There, they at least get taken care of and they all pass with smiles on their faces. Some of them realize that it's not a normal hospital but compared to their stressful lives, they find the place still much better. They also have a big tree with cats and dogs so everyone just enjoys living together. Once the machai rice is perfectly cooked, Yoshi is now in charge of pounding it. After a lot of trials, he finally succeeds in pounding the bowl full of rice. However, Ishiki and Akain arrive bearing loads more rice for him to pound. Night falls and Yoshi is tired from all that pounding. Kiri stuffs his mouth with food and Yoshi is instantly energized by the delicious machai. The yakai have started turning the rice he pounded into machai rice cakes. Not only that, they are also cooking stews. Furuhanya abruptly emerges from the bushes tired from all his world traveling and begs Ishiki for food. However, Ishiki is repelled by his disgusting smell and advises Yoshi to wash Furuhanya. Yoshi remembers how Furuhanya used to embarrassingly bathe him when he collapsed during training and he realizes this is his chance to get even. Thus, he happily accepts the job. But instead of getting embarrassed, Furuhanya embraced him with open arms. After bathing in the hot springs, Yoshi sees that tables were being set up next to the waterfall. Vans also start arriving soon and yakai of all types with bandages start walking out of them. Old people in wheelchairs are also being pushed by Akain to the waiting tables. Akain also introduces her master to Yoshi, Dr. Fujiyuki. When the party starts, everyone starts happily eating and drinking under the moonlight. Fool himself is delighted at the event because the moon has always been intimately related to magic. He asks Yoshi to bathe in its moonlight because it also enhances spiritual power, thus increasing his familiar's powers as well. The talk of his familiars makes Yoshi suddenly realize something. He could have the muscular and omnipotent Jin do the machai pounding instead of doing it himself. The elderly people particularly enjoy the beautiful outdoors and warm food. Yoshi asks Akain if these are all her parents but Akain clarifies that some patients couldn't travel so they're having a separate party in the hospital courtyard. 
one of Akain's co-workers happily drinks the sake and Yoshi wonders if he's also a psychic too. To his surprise, the man was actually a furry. Furs grow all over his body and he turns into a werewolf. Later, Yoshi is gazing at the moon when he notices that an elderly woman is sitting alone in her wheelchair. He is about to approach her when Kiri beats him to her and approaches the lady. Upon seeing the child Kiri, the old woman can't help but cry as she remembers her past. She gently pats Kiri in the head and Kiri asks her to pick him up. Seeing them together makes Yoshi remember his own family watching the moon. Despite her hard life, the elderly woman was glad that she got to enjoy the end of it. She shakes Yoshi's hand and thanks and thanks the yokais as well. With a smile, she then vanishes into brilliant gold light that dissipates into the moon. One by one, the other elderlies thank them and disappear in a brilliant white light, passing on to the next life. The next morning, they see Kiri creating machai rice from mud outside. They laugh at his antics and Mariko joins him in his games. When Fukase arrives, they start flinging mud at each other in a mudball fight. Unfortunately for him, playing around in the morning meant Yoshi had to run and almost be late for school. The gates are about to be shut before the other late students can enter but Chayaki sensei stops the gate and lets the latecomers in warning them that next time they should wake up earlier. During English class, Aoki-sensei is still being her knowledgeable self astounding others with her English skills. Watching these two teachers, Yoshi observes that Chayaki and Aoki are opposite of each other. Chayaki's popular with rebellious students while Aoki's popular with studious girls. After class, Yoshi sees Yamamoto alone again in the hallway and he is about to talk to her when he gets called by Aoki-sensei. Aoki mentions how she had learned that Yoshi's parents both died and she commends Yoshi for still being a good student despite that. She is sure that his parents must be very proud of him. She then promises Yoshi that he can always talk to her to help him in his suffering. To Yoshi's confusion, Aoki's act of empathy makes him mad. During lunch, Toshiro also complains about an interaction she had with Aoki-sensei. She was talking with Chayaki-sensei when Aoki suddenly arrived and scolds her for calling Chayaki in a friendly manner. She then also asks Chayaki not to let the girls touch him inappropriately as a teacher. The other girls think that Chayaki did this because she cared about them but Tashiro herself felt mad, although she didn't know why. Yoshi guesses that maybe it's because Aoki acts like they understand them. For example, Tashiro calls Yoshi in a friendly manner, but she still uses honorifics for other people. Maybe Aoki-sensei didn't know that so that's why she gave her that advice. Aoki only sees a part of them but she acts like she sees it all. Yoshi recognizes that this is also what happened to him. Without his parents, it was true that life is hard. But that doesn't mean that his life is ruined. Without talking to him or seeing anything, Aoki decided how things were for him based on her own values. Aoki then appears and gives Yoshi an English dictionary for their class. Yoshi tries to give it back but Aoki points out that he probably doesn't have any spare money for it so he should just take it. She also tells the other students that she's not playing favorites because they all know about Yoshi's special situation. Aoki is about to leave but Yoshi can't take it anymore and he tells her that he's not special nor does he feel handicapped. However, Aoki smiles and agrees, cheering him on. Back at the apartment, Yoshi scares the other yakais with the rants he spouts off about Aoki. Even Fool advises him to calm down since his aura is fluctuating wildly. What does calm him down is a postcard from Hayes informing him that he's at Liechtenstein Castle in Germany, and he'll be bringing presents the next time he visits. After dinner, Yoshi shares his troubles with the adults of Katabuki So. They all cheer Aoki's beauty but they do acknowledge that she sounds like a pain to hang out with. Sato narrates how someone in his job used to be just like Aoki. He was a nice guy and he'd care too much about new hires. He'd take away jobs that the new guy had to learn without letting him do anything or speak. In the end, the new guy couldn't get any work and he wasn't able to grow. Even if the boss tried to blame the new guy, he'd cover for him, pointing out that the new guy is still a newbie. From the start, he decided that the new guy couldn't do anything. Being nice and caring isn't a good thing. What's good are the results that it can bring about. Sato's story makes Yoshi realize the difference between Aoki and Ryu. Despite the two having a similar aura and offering their help, Ryu never gave him advice or help when he was suffering during his spiritual training. But he was still there, believing in him and watching him. That was his kindness. Aoki's kindness on the other hand is the opposite. She's forcing her good intentions on other people. The next day during club activities, the club president hands out the tasks to the different members. Yoshi was glad he didn't get any speaking roles. When Yamamoto arrives and chooses to just quietly sit in the back, the club president insists that she participate in the club activities on the upcoming social with the foreigners club. If she just wants to read, then she can go read in the library. 
Yamamoto angrily storms out and leaves. Unfortunately for them, Aoki sees her leaving and berates the club for bullying Yamamoto. They try to explain what happened but Aoki insists that they should just be friends. Their club president finally relents and assures Aoki-sensei that they'll try to be civil. Later, Yoshi is walking in the school courtyard pondering what Aoki-sensei said when he runs into Chayaki. Upon hearing his problems, Chayaki advises that they should just have to adapt to people like that, just like how their club president did. There, Aoki once again sees them but Chayaki comes to his defense and explains that he's just advising Yoshi. Aoki tells Yoshi he could have just come to her. Chayaki tells him that Yoshi is fine but Aoki doesn't believe him. After all, Yoshi is an orphan and lives alone. In his mind, Yoshi wants to angrily blurt out that he's not alone. But Aoki is already deciding things on her own again. Chayaki stands up and points out that Yoshi's collar is clean. His ears don't have piercings, and he's well-muscled, meaning that he's taking care of himself properly. Someone who's doing that clearly doesn't need their help. Yoshi realizes that this was what Chayaki was checking the other day on him. Aoki smiles and points out that Yoshi can still feel lonely when he doesn't feel well or isn't at school, so she can still come to him. Yoshi observes that they can never change her mind so he relents and promises to do that. After she leaves, Yoshi rants his anger away and Chayaki pats him on the head and tells him he's just happy that his class is full of good students he can believe in. Class had just ended and it's a three-day weekend ahead for Yoshi and his friends. Tashiro and the others happily plan things to do while Yoshi is left moping over the fact that he has to work that coming weekend. If not, he won't be able to pay rent on time again. The next day, Yoshi heads to the warehouse where he works. There, his boss introduces him to two new part-timers, Sasaki and Kawashima, and his boss asks him to show them the ropes. The two new guys are obviously still nervous and shy which makes Yoshi nervous too. He couldn't even tell if they were listening to his instructions or not. Thankfully, they seem to do the job correctly when the work starts. He sometimes gives them additional instructions like using the dolly when more work comes piling up. During the workday, Fool also appears and advises him to use his summons to make their physical labor easier. For example, Goelums, the stone doll, can carry anything. Jin could easily stack up the boxes, or even Brondies can blow the boxes away. Yoshi however finds some way that this would end up badly so he just puts Fool and the magical book in his locker. During lunch, Yoshi hoped to get closer to the two newcomers, but they opt to eat by themselves, reminding Yoshi of Yamamoto who also chooses to do things alone. When the afternoon batch of packages arrives, the workers get back to work. Their boss hands some cold coffee to Yoshi and the newcomers and they all thank him. After drinking the cold coffee, the two newcomers smile and compliment the coffee, surprising Yoshi that they start talking to each other. Back at home, Yoshi shares his experience once again with the others and Sato tells him that the newcomers probably learned to communicate with their bodies in the end. These days, youth are surrounded by information but that means they don't develop the important skill of how to learn information. In the past, information wasn't freely given but was a reward after showing interest and taking action. Because of that effort put in, it becomes something that teaches you. The newcomers are probably happy to receive coffee as a reward for their efforts, and the thank you was something that came from their bodies. Later that night, Yoshi is pondering Sato's wise words when he sees Fool crying in the corner. He realized that he forgot about them in the locker and he quickly apologized. The next day, Yoshi goes back to work and greets Sasaki and Kawashima good morning. This time, the two part-timers greet him back. Yoshi once again gives them their assignment for the day, and Yoshi observes that they're more efficient than yesterday. During lunch, Sasaki even offered to buy Yoshi his drink, surprising Yoshi once again. He also notices that they text a lot on their phones, meaning that they do like talking to people but probably not just in person. This confuses Yoshi but he also remembers how he'd been misunderstood in the past after he said what he was thinking. Sometimes, even when looking at someone, he also can't say what he wants. However, he also knows that talking to others is even more enjoyable. That afternoon, an emergency additional truck of packages arrived for a rush job, forcing everyone to work overtime. Nevertheless, Yoshi noticed that Sasaki and Kawashima enjoyed the work. Unfortunately, the warehouse manager suddenly arrived the next morning and informed them of the bad news. A package marked Keep Upright was delivered upside down, ruining its contents. Upon learning where it was delivered to, they discovered that it was assigned to Sasaki and Kawashima, the new part-timers. 
However, the two are confused and ask what keep upright means. The manager is about to berate them when Yoshi's boss suddenly apologizes to the manager for not teaching them about the warning labels. Yoshi also bows his head and admits he was the one in charge of teaching the newbies. Sasaki and Kawashima also apologize since it was their fault. With that, the manager calmly tells them it's just one package and they should just ensure it doesn't happen again. With that, the manager explains to them the warning labels and they all go back to work. Later, the two ask Yoshi if they have to pay for the damages in the box but Yoshi assures them no. He realizes that Sasaki and Kawashima probably don't know why their boss apologized, so Yoshi tells them a story. When he was a kid, a classmate of theirs was messing around while cleaning and broke the window. When the teacher arrived, it was the team leader who apologized first, so the teacher couldn't be angry. Of course, it was partly the team leader's responsibility, but he just tried to keep the boy who broke it from getting in trouble. The story makes Sasaki and Kawashima realize that they should thank their boss and apologize again to the manager. Yoshi encourages them and with that, he hopes that they are able to continue developing and creating good memories interacting with each other. Later that night, Fool commends Yoshi for teaching others. For him, it was noble of someone to apologize if it were another's fault. However, Yoshi admits that there is actually more to that story. The one who covered for the boy who broke the window was actually Hase. He asked him why he did that and Hase admits it's because now, the boy owes him something so he can use it to shut him up for a while. So really, Hase wasn't being noble but actually just calculating. Back at the apartment, it seems that Hase has arrived and is now feeding the others various delicacies from his travels in Europe. Hase hands him a souvenir shirt and he joins them while Hase talks about his trip. On this fateful day, a girl is overwhelmed by her memories. Quarreling with her friends and confronting her mother, all these memories are making her just give up. Yoshi was passing by when he felt a strange feeling, just like when Tashiro was in danger. Looking around, he sees a girl on top of a building and he quickly runs to take action. On the rooftop, he sees the girl over the railing and is about to jump. Fool remarks that maybe she's just trying to learn how to fly while the girl asks Yoshi what he's doing there. Yoshi tries to talk her back into the safe part of the rooftop but the girl replies that she's just sick of everything. Yoshi can see a dark aura permeating out of the girl. She then suddenly leans over to fall and Yoshi realizes that he's too far to help her. Thankfully, Fool suddenly appears to the girl and advises her that suicide would send her to hell which is full of demons. Upon seeing the suddenly floating spirit in front of her, the girl quickly runs and cries for her mommy, ultimately crashing into Yoshi. Later, Yoshi is telling them about everything that happened and the others commend Fool for his timely action. Yoshi also shares that the girl is just in sixth grade. Akain informs Yoshi that the cops called. It turns out that the girl went to the police and told them about Yoshi so she can thank him. They were glad to learn that she's okay but Ishiki warns Yoshi that when someone who tried to kill themselves is saved, they can start to depend on the one who saved them for everything. Yoshi heads to the police station and just like Ishiki predicted, the girl profusely thanks her and introduces herself as Yumi. Yumi explains that she made some fun new friends but they tried to make her do bad things like shoplifting. She couldn't do them anymore and then her mom got mad when she found out. They fought and she just didn't know what to do anymore so she headed to that roof. Yoshi realizes upon hearing Yumi's story that she's probably just unbalanced. Her body's grown up and she thinks she can do different things but her mind's still a child's. Yoshi consoles the girl and assures her that her feelings are heard. Her parents are just strict because they love her. From that moment on, Yumi starts appearing everywhere around Yoshi like when he's walking home from school or going to work. Ishiki laughs at Yoshi's trouble since his prediction came true. She truly is now dependent on him. One day, Yumi once again tries to tag along with Yoshi so he decides that this time, he'll bring her along. He asks her to wear more normal clothes and be as polite as possible. Then, he brings her to the social English conversation club planned with the foreigners club. Yoshi introduces Yumi to Tashiro who was happily eating in the event, and to George, the president of the foreigners club. While Yumi interacts with the other guests, the club president gets a phone call and learns that one of their members won't be able to make it. Unfortunately, he was supposed to be the main character's voice actor for the anime they're dubbing. Thus, he asks Yoshi to be the voice actor instead. Yoshi wanted to deny the job but upon seeing Yumi, he decided to accept it. Thus, the English Conversation Club started dubbing the anime of Nada de Coco Quest. They tell the story of Nada de Coco's attempt in saving Princess Panacotta. Everyone applauds their masterful dubbing including Yumi who was amazed at what she watched. Meanwhile, outside the event, Yamamoto is eavesdropping and leaves. After the party ends, Yoshi and Yumi bade goodbye to George and thanked him for their hospitality. 
George commends their English-speaking skills and tells them they are welcome anytime. The two are walking home when Yumi thanks Yoshi for bringing her along and telling her to be polite. All of a sudden, Yumi's old friends show up and ask her if Yoshi's her boyfriend. Meanwhile, Yoshi notices a dark aura enveloping Yumi's friends. They once again try to ask Yumi to come with them since they need new things from the mall but this time, Yumi manages to reject them. She tells them that she has learned a lot of stories today from all over the world, and she realizes that what they've been doing is really stupid. Their makeup and flashy clothes are just playing as a make-believe grown-up when she wants to be a real one. Her friends get offended at her accusations and they quickly grab her. Yoshi sees that things are escalating so he asks Yumi to close her eyes. He then holds back his power and summons Brondies, creating a bolt of lightning that stuns all the girls. With that, he and Yumi were able to leave in peace. Afterward, Yumi apologizes to Yoshi since she won't come and see him anymore. She decided that she wants to learn English so she'll be focusing her time on that. Yoshi happily cheers her on and they separate ways. At home, Yumi apologizes to her mom for her behavior while Yoshi tells the others the good news. Ishiki remarks how this must be the power of a child to head straight into a new world they're interested in. Yoshi is just glad that everything is over and he enjoys dinner with a kain and haste. In this episode, Chaiki sensei announces that it's time for the class to decide what they'll do for the upcoming culture fair. He then calls over the class president to preside over the class and goes to the back of the classroom to sleep. The whole class is confused that their teacher is sleeping just like that but their class president catches their attention and tells them they have to plan for the culture fair. While his classmates are busily giving suggestions, Yoshi stares at Chayaki and wonders if Chayaki is tired because he is also in charge of counseling. Tashiro whispers to him that there are actually a lot fewer people causing problems nowadays. It seems that Chayaki made friends with the people likely to cause problems so they are now also apprehensive causing problems for the teachers. Tashiro happily takes a picture of their sleeping teacher, but to her surprise, Chayaki scolds her for using her cell phone during class and rolls over to sleep more. Yoshi stares at Chayaki and remembers how Chayaki told him he believes in them. He realizes that he has to live up to that. Meanwhile, Tashiro takes this opportunity to take a picture of Yoshi fondly staring at Chayaki. In the end, their class settled on doing a demon fighting game. As for the English Conversation Club, they also have a discussion on what to do during the culture fair. Yoshi notices that Yamamoto never came back after their confrontation with her, and he wonders what happened to her. Their club president mentions that she sent her some messages but they ultimately cannot make her attend so they can't do anything else. Tashiro shares that she actually gathered some info about Yamamoto. It turns out that she came from Jinmei, a famously good school, but she would always show off her knowledge, interrupting teachers or answering out of turn. Her classmates couldn't take it anymore and they started ignoring her so she stopped going to school anymore. Yoshi suggests that Yamamoto might have family problems but Tashiro also refutes this. According to her sources, she has a normal family. The one thing that stands out is that she has a big sister who's said to be smart and pretty and is an ideal student. In other words, she might have an inferiority complex. Especially because when Yamamoto was little, it was said that she was so sickly and weak. Yoshi finally understands Yamamoto's problem and he realizes that the old him was probably like her too. When he was living in his uncle's house, his aunt and uncle never treated him differently. However, there were slight differences between the way they treated him and their daughter Eriko. But then, he remembers how he was always hungry in middle school while Eriko hated all kinds of foods. So they surely won't eat the same food. He convinced himself that they treated them differently so he made a huge deal out of things that were nothing. Yamamoto must just be doing the same things now. Yoshi's hypothesis is exactly right as Yamamoto enviously watches a happy family after school. She recalls her struggles of studying hard so that she won't lose to her sister when her parents just decided for themselves that she was their poor little daughter who can't do anything due to illness. At school the next day, Fool asks Yoshi what he plans to do about Yamamoto but Yoshi admits that he can't do anything unless Yamamoto herself admits that she needs help. He truly wants to do something but he feels that it's arrogant to think he can change someone's heart. He visits Chayaki in the faculty room to ask for some advice and he notices some medicine on Chayaki's desk. Meanwhile, Aoki tries to tell Yoshi that she can ask for her advice instead but Chayaki pretends that Yoshi is actually asking for help breaking up a fight, thus the need for him to help, not her. On the rooftop, he relays every problem his club is having with Yamamoto as well as Aoki. But instead of giving him a solution, Chayaki's advice is that they will just have to take their time. 
In a case like this, nothing anyone says matters. It all depends on someone's fate whether they recover or not. After that, Yoshi tries to take the initiative and goes to talk to Yamamoto at the library. He amicably asks her if she has any ideas on what their club can do at the culture fair, but Yamamoto replies that she doesn't have time to waste helping them. A club at their level has nothing to offer her. Yoshi goes home sad that day, disappointed that he couldn't help Yamamoto. To cheer himself up, he has a delicious lunch with Hayes and the others, with Hayes once again regaling them with stories from his school trip to Europe. Yoshi shows his jealousy of leaving the country so Hayes offers to help him visit Singapore for just 30,000 yen. Hearing their talk of travels of course caught the attention of Furuhanya who invited them to go somewhere more fun. However, they vehemently refuse his offer because Furuhanya's trips are more like wilderness survival than tourism. Later that night, he also asks Hayes for his opinion on the issue about Yamamoto, and Hayes suggests that he should just be nice to her, compliment her interests and her knowledge. Yoshi doesn't want to do this because this would make him like Aoki who only focuses on one aspect of a person but he realizes that the fact that Yamamoto is in their English club and Aoki is their English teacher must have a karmic connection between the two. The next day, the English Conversation Club finalizes its plan of conducting a play during the culture fair. Yoshi laments that Yamamoto never came back to the club but unbeknownst to them, Yamamoto was standing right outside the door with her own proposal. Upon hearing that they have already decided, she tears up her proposal and angrily leaves. The date of the culture fair is getting close but a big wall separates Yoshi and the fair. Yes, it's his midterm exam. Yoshi is more worried since he has less time for studying than others due to his work and daily training. But he can't let that beat him on his road to becoming a government official. At Katabuki So, the gang is resting after a hearty dinner when they ask Antiquary if he has any new interesting artifacts. Antiquary admits that he has but he hesitates to show it. After a few more convincing, Antiquary's servant brings forth a weird-looking lamp. He then explains that it's an omnidirectional 3D projector. Before he demonstrates, he first asks a kind to construct a barrier around the room, making Hase and Yoshi suspicious that it might be something dangerous. Yoshi voices out that he has to study but Antiquary assures him that what they'll be doing won't take long and it's something that Yoshi might only see once in a century. With that, Antiquary turns off the lights and inserts some kind of chip into the lamp. Then all of a sudden, the whole gang was transported into the sky or more like a projection of the sky was projected around them. Yoshi wonders how the lamp works when Sato answers his question by exclaiming that they aren't on Earth anymore. A large dinosaur-like creature then flies over them astonishing them all. Next, they were transported to a wide desert where a huge silver construct glitters in the middle of it. Suddenly, the construct moved and it turned out that it was the scale of a huge fish that lives in the desert. Their happy sightseeing is cut short however when a dark plume of cloud shoots down from the sky and a man appears before them. The man compliments their barrier and easily destroys it. Kiri starts crying and Yoshi pulls out the Petit Arizoican to defend themselves but Fool stops him. Fool exclaims that even a billion Yoshi would not be able to defeat the man. Yoshi disregards his warning and summons a thunderbolt but it has no effect on the man. Meanwhile, Antiquary walks in front of them and addresses the man. He urges the man to stop or else he'd be forced to remove his eye patch. The man smiles and asks Antiquary if he's threatening them. He then calls Antiquary the heretic of the far reaches, surprising Yoshi. However, Antiquary insists that he's just an ordinary Antiquary. The man releases his spiritual energy, causing the wind to violently gust over the gang. Antiquary sends one of his subordinates to attack but the man just deflects his minion back. Left with no choice, Antiquary smiles and bids them farewell before removing his eye patch. However, it was just a bluff to gain time as more of Antiquary's minions appears and throws smoke bombs all over the place, obscuring everyone's vision. And just like that, Yoshi and the others are back at Katabuki So, minus Antiquary. Yoshi asks what just happened and Furuhanya explains that those were Congresso Vietato, the Miracle Hunters. Basically, he was an agent for the Secret Church. The Secret Church deals with the stuff the Church does secretly like exorcisms, spirit summoning, ghosts, and monsters. There are many government-run special agencies like that and the Secret Church leads them all. The Congresso Vietato is one of their special agencies. They collect things that might create miracles that would deceive the masses. Yoshi asks what would happen to Antiquary now but the others nonchalantly answer that they're not that easy to get caught. Furuhanya did get captured once and he was forced to take lessons and do three months of volunteer work. Late that night, Yoshi and Hayes can't seem to sleep. Yoshi laments that he didn't get any studying done. 
The next day, Hase is tutoring Yoshi in a restaurant when Tashiro suddenly barges in and takes pictures of them. Yoshi hurriedly explains that they're just old friends and introduces the two to each other. The two quickly become friends as Tashiro offers secret information about Yoshi to Hase, who contemplates deeply about buying it. After reviewing with Hase, Yoshi heads back to Katabuki so only to be dragged by Furuhanya who tells him he has something for him. He brings Yoshi to the field beside the waterfall where the others including Fujiyoki were there. Yoshi curiously asks if there's another hospital event but Furuhanya clarifies that he was actually hoping for Fujiyoki to appraise something he found called the Elixir of Immortality, Amrita. He has to travel far and deep into the jungle to find the village where a shady old lady was guarding it. He showered her with gifts and after a hefty payment, she gave him the bottle. Fujiyoki casts an appraisal spell on the bottle to read the item history, and after a moment, he concludes that the bottle seems real. It's probably not immortality but a powerful, life-extending magic has been cast on it. The last person who took it was the old woman herself who's probably more than 800 years old. She was once a priestess and its original holder entrusted the elixir to her so it would not be misused. The priestess used the elixir to help people with every single drop using it to heal those in need. Years passed and people slowly forgot the legend of the elixir, and the lady finally got some peace and quiet. So when someone finally arrives trying to buy it from her, she sells it for a hefty sum. Alas, it's only a bottle now. Furuhanya shakes the bottle in anger and it truly was empty. The old woman had swindled him. However, Furuhanya manages to get one last drop from the bottle. They all dip their fingers in it, sharing it amongst themselves and tasting it. Fujioki estimates that maybe they'll live for around seven months longer. Afterward, Yoshi was given the empty bottle by Furuhanya and he went back to his room to study. When morning arrives, Yoshi is sleeping on his desk with his notebook empty. It looks like he didn't get to study after all. It was the morning of Yoshi's exams and his worrying had ruined Yoshi's appetite for the food. Fool suggests that he can always use them to get rid of the test papers and they can easily burn. Blow or soak the exam papers, allowing Yoshi to take a makeup test some other time. Yoshi scolds Fool for his tempting ideas. Yoshi dutifully takes the exam and is totally burnt out at the end of it. However, a commotion outside catches his attention and he sees Chayaki dragging another student to the faculty room. Tashiro asks around for what happened and they learn that the student was caught cheating with his phone. When he was caught, the cheater tried to run and for the first time, they saw Chayaki get angry and shout. Yoshi realizes that Chayaki might be really furious because he was lax and letting students keep their smartphones. But this is how they repaid his trust. Kind people like him or Ryo are very scary when they get angry. The other students wonder if Chayaki was just tricking them by pretending to be a nice teacher when he's actually really scary. Tishiro's friend points out that this is wrong since no matter how nice a person is, when a child does something really wrong, then it's a grown-up's job to scold them. Another student supports this by narrating how Chayaki is always funny and fun to be around. She thought he wasn't really serious about his job but seeing him now shows how seriously he takes teaching. Later, Fool remarks that he's glad they defended Chayaki. When you see a different side of someone than you expected, whether you see it as positive or negative reflects a lot on the people. In that sense, Tashiro's friends are very noble girls. After dinner, Yoshi shares what's happening at school once again with the others and they give out their opinions. Normally, the cheater's parents would be called and the cheater would be suspended. However, it would probably be more than that. Hayes guesses that their school would probably call a general assembly to address the issue. After finally finishing all their exams on the second day, Chayaki enters the room with a stern face and informs them that they will be having a general assembly. Hase's prediction was right. Meanwhile at home, the others are getting bored with nothing to do so they decide to watch what's happening at Yoshi's school through a yakai. At the gymnasium, Chayaki stands in front of everyone and explains what happened. During midterms, a smartphone was used to cheat. Their school technically doesn't allow cell phones on the premises, but doing daily searches isn't practical so he overlooked it as long as everyone behaved. He angrily expresses his disappointment about being betrayed like this. He was a fool to trust and spoil them so from now on, he'll be extremely strict about phones. No one can bring any phones and if he finds one, he will stomp on them. To show his dedication, he stomps on a phone. The students think that Chayaki might be going too far and their thoughts are given voice by Aoki who starts speaking. She implores Chayaki to think about the students' feelings and show more consideration. The students start cheering her on and shouting out that they aren't the ones who cheated. They start throwing stuff at Chayaki and boo him. 
Chayaki angrily berates Aoki for interrupting and tells her to mind her own business, making all her fans angrier than ever. They demand that he apologize to her. Yoshi realizes that if this continues, everything will turn into a mess. He has to do something. Fool appears in his pocket and reminds him that he can use the patisse for this kind of occasion. This gives Yoshi an idea and he orders Fool to topple the microphone beside Chayaki. The ensuing noise caused by the microphone quiets everyone down and the student council president picks up the mic. President Kamiya tells everyone to sit down and she asks both Chayaki and Aoki-sensei to refrain from getting emotional. She then apologizes to Chayaki for betraying the teacher's trust and accepts that if smartphones are completely banned, they cannot complain. However, they promise to maintain good behavior if they give them another chance. The students show their support for President Kamiya and give her a round of applause. Chayaki finally relents and agrees to let them bring their phones. However, poor behavior would result in the confiscation of phones to be returned upon graduation. The students quickly complain and President Kamiya tries to negotiate it down to three days of confiscation. Even the students beg Chayaki to lower the confiscation period. After a period of negotiation, both parties agree to a confiscation of one month, earning them a cheer from the students. Meanwhile, the guys watching from Katabuki so see the strategy Chayaki used to get the students' cooperation. He started with a demanding offer to get someone to the line he really wanted. He deliberately destroyed a phone to show how harsh he was and then instituted harsh conditions to make the students think things were as bad as possible. Then, he gradually compromised so everyone accepted it as better than things currently were. Yoshi also realizes this thanks to Fool's explanation. Of course, not everything went as planned but thanks to Yoshi's quick intervention, everything ended okay. After the general assembly, the students are leaving the gymnasium when Yoshi hears some students still believing that Chayaki is controlling them with violence and authority. However, he accepts the fact that having everyone peacefully understand what's happening is too idealistic. Meanwhile, another group of girls that are fans of Aoki are harboring resentment against Chayaki sensei At home, Hayes commends Yoshi for his performance during the General Assembly. It turns out that Chayaki truly asked President Kamiya before he started the General Assembly for her to give an alternate proposal. Thanks to Yoshi's interference, she was able to join in on the discussion and create a compromise between the students and the teachers. During dinner, Yoshi mentions how they can now focus on their cultural festival preparation. The Katabuki So Festival immediately perks up upon hearing that there will be a festival, and they quickly ask Yoshi where it will be held. Back at school, everyone is busy creating props and booths for their exhibits at the cultural fair. As for Yoshi, he's drawing masks for their Oni hunting game. Some of their classmates are still grumbling about the new cell phone rules and how Chayaki sensei seems to be skipping their classes again. Yoshi gets frustrated at them but ultimately, he or Tashiro can't do anything about it. Meanwhile, Yamamoto's class is having a cafe exhibit but Yamamoto is still not participating, opting to just read a book in the corner. Aoki notices this and looks worriedly at her. President Kamiya later talks to Yoshi and Tashiro to bring up the issue of growing resentment against Chayaki sensei among the student body. She then explains that after the cheating, the teaching staff actually decided that all cell phones would be banned. However, Chayaki sensei was the only one against it and he asked to have a student assembly. For the student's sake, he volunteered to be the bad guy in their eyes. To repay him back, President Kamiya wants to do something for him and so, she asks Tashiro to gather information about Chayaki. When Yoshi arrives back at the Yakai apartment, he was surprised to see the apartment residents all trying on different school uniforms brought by antiquary. Yoshi tries to ask what happened after Antiquary disappeared back during their confrontation with the secret church but Antiquary's lips are sealed. The next day at Yamamoto's class, her classmates are whispering if they should ask Yamamoto to participate in creating the booths. However, they're afraid that she'll just rant about how pointless it is. They didn't know that Yamamoto could hear them who angrily leaves the room. She heads to the English conversation club where Yoshi and the others are practicing for their play. She overhears them having trouble with some of the English lines, irritating Yamamoto once again and she is about to enter and correct them when their club president corrects them herself. This stops Yamamoto from participating and she quietly leaves before anyone can even notice her. Yoshi did manage to see her and run after her but Aoki suddenly talks to him. She once again asks him if he's having any problems with him being all by himself. Meanwhile, Yamamoto completely exits the school and goes home. There are eight days left before the start of the culture fair and Yoshi's being worked to the bone. 
to get some reprieve from work. He decides to take a rest at the rooftop where he surprisingly meets Chayaki. He asks Chayaki to come back to class sometimes but Chayaki believes they can do well without him. Meanwhile, Chayaki also asks how Yamamoto is doing and Yoshi admits that it's still tough interacting with her. Yoshi is about to go back down to his classroom when he notices a dark aura emanating from C. Hayaki's chest. He instantly recognizes it as the same aura that he absorbed from Tashiro when she was hit by a motorbike. He can see the aura growing larger and Chayaki enduring the pain so Yoshi touches his chest and asks Chayaki to keep quiet. After concentrating, he manages to absorb the aura into his own body. Chayaki was surprised that he feels better but Yoshi explains that he just gave him some form of massage. He asks Chayaki if he has some form of disease and Chayaki admits that he actually has anemia. While walking home, Yoshi wonders if Chayaki might be pushing himself too hard with all that's happening at their school. Meanwhile, Fool commends Yoshi for helping out another human. Yoshi was glad that he was able to put his training to use but Fool points out that he probably couldn't do it with anyone. He and Chayaki seem to just have very compatible bodies. However, Yoshi suddenly sees the aura emanating from his own hand and he suddenly faints. When he woke up, he was back in Katabuki so under Akain's care. Akain warns him to be careful in absorbing others' injuries because Yoshi himself could pass out or even die. After Yoshi looks properly chastised, Akain smiles and invites him for dinner. After dinner, he tells them about Chayaki's condition and Ishiki laments that there's nothing one can do about anemia except take medicine. If it gets bad enough, it can even cause a coma. The brain won't get enough blood causing it to shut down and the heart will follow suit. It's the same reason why people pass out when they get choked due to a lack of oxygen in the brain. Antiquary suddenly barges in with a new secret medicine, but when they ask him to try it out on himself, he quickly leaves again as fast as he comes. Yoshi decides that he should simply be happy that he could save Chayaki. Meanwhile, Yamamoto is angrily writing something down at home. It's the day of the culture fair and Yoshi notices that the other yakais seem to be strangely excited. Meanwhile, Yamamoto's parents warn her not to push herself too far during the culture fair or she might get sick again, making Yamamoto grit her teeth in annoyance. At school, Yoshi creates the sound effects for their English conversation club play while Tashiro and their club president act as fighting sisters that reconcile in the end. After the performance, Yamamoto suddenly enters. The club president warmly welcomes her and asks her if she's going to help with the play. However, Yamamoto reads through their scripts and makes fun of them. She then hands her notice of withdrawal from the club and thanks them for nothing. The club president calmly accepts her withdrawal which infuriates Yamamoto once again. She also tells Yoshi that he should stop flaunting the meals his mother cooked for him since they're not kids anymore. In a flash, Toshiro suddenly slaps Yamamoto and shouts at her that Yoshi's parents died in a car accident. Yoshi tries to restrain Toshiro while Yamamoto cries and accuses them of tricking her. She exclaims how no one understands her at home or at school and just because Yoshi's parents died, why is he so special? Yoshi can see a terrible aura emanating from Yamamoto, and Fool recognizes it as negative feelings of rage, envy, and jealousy. Yoshi tries to talk to her but Yamamoto pushes her away and curls up on the ground while crying. At that moment, Aoki appears and she gently goes to Yamamoto. She agrees with her that she's done nothing wrong and apologizes for hurting her. Yamamoto hugs her and slowly but surely, the aura surrounding Yamamoto fades away. Aoki Sensei continues consoling the crying Yamamoto while asking the English Conversation Club to just be friends with each other. Unfortunately, the club president speaks up and elucidates that they can't just all hold hands and be friends like they're in kindergarten. Aoki accepts their answer and leaves with Yamamoto. The English Conversation Club wonders why it seems like they're being made the bad guys here but their club president just catches their attention and tells them to go back to work. Later, Yoshi passes by Yamamoto who's now happily one of Aoki's fans and gladly talks to her. Yoshi recognizes that maybe Yamamoto just needed someone who will accept her and forgive her, just like Aoki. Not only Yamamoto but all the students who looked up to Aoki Sensei were the quiet and serious ones that don't stand out in class. They lack self-confidence and are unsatisfied and worried, so Aoki who never tells them they're wrong must be like a goddess to them. Tashiro wonders if this really is the best outcome, but Chayaki appears and tells them that it doesn't matter. If it helped Yamamoto, it helped. It must just be fate that they end up together. Meanwhile, one of Aoki's fans notices Chayaki and grits her teeth in anger. Later that night, Yoshi bids everyone goodbye since he'll be spending the night at the school to prepare for the first day of the culture fair tomorrow. After he leaves, one of the small yakais brings down a pamphlet for the culture fair and hands it to Akain. 
With that, they decide to go visit the culture fair tomorrow, with the Onis interested in attending the Oni hunting games, Mariko wanting to join the beauty pageant, Akain entering the eating contest, and more. At school, Yoshi gives out some food Ruriko prepared for his classmates and Tashiro leaves to go find Chayaki to share the food with. Outside, he sees that some of his classmates are still busily building their booths, and he wonders if they can finish on time. Fool implores him to use the patis to work, like Goelums to carry the tools or the Norns to do fortune-telling, but Yoshi just rejects his advice. A girl passes behind Yoshi and he immediately feels something bad is about to happen. At the faculty office, Chayaki is resting when a girl suddenly enters. A little while later, Yoshi arrives at the faculty office just in time to see the girl leave. He enters the room and sees Chayaki bleeding profusely from a cut on his arm. Yoshi runs after the girl and uses the patis to hold her in place. When he finally catches up to her, he recognizes her as one of Aoki's fans. He asks her if Aoki ordered it but the girl vehemently defends Aoki. She was the one who's angry at Chayaki for being so rash against the kind Aoki that she decided to hurt him. Aoki had nothing to do with it. Yoshi takes the box cutter the girl was wielding and threatens to show it to the other teachers during their meetings. The others' views on Aoki would surely change then. The girl begs Yoshi not to do that since this incident doesn't involve her. Yoshi agrees on one condition, she stays away from Chayaki. He then retracts his summons and lets her run away. When Yoshi returned to the faculty room, Chayaki had fainted on the ground. Yoshi recalls how blood loss coupled with anemia might have caused Chayaki to fall into a coma. Meanwhile, a dark aura is once again spreading over Chayaki. Yoshi was about to absorb it but he hesitates since he's not sure he can handle such a huge amount of damage. Thankfully, a memory of haste calms him down and he summons Jin. He then orders Jin to bring the medicine bottle Amrita from his room. When the bottle appears, there is thankfully one other drop from the bottle and he feeds it to Chayaki. A white light slowly blossoms on Chayaki's chest and drives away the dark aura, completely curing him of his injuries. Chayaki slowly wakes up but he can't seem to remember recent events. Yoshi quickly makes an alibi that Chayaki passed out from blood loss due to a nosebleed. Yoshi retrieves the Amrita bottle when he feels that there's another drop inside. He puts it in his hand and demands that Chayaki lick it. Yoshi's pushiness convinces Chayaki to lick his hand, and Yoshi realizes that he could have just put the droplet in Chayaki's own hand. Meanwhile, Toshiro catches them once again and takes a picture before running away. Back at Katabuki So, Furuhanya arrives once again, this time completely parched and asking for water. Kiri gives in to his request and starts watering him with a watering can. Later, he finally gets a cup of water but to his confusion, no one was inside the apartment. Therefore, Kiri shows him the poster of Yoshi's cultural festival, informing him of everybody's location. Meanwhile, at school, the whole cultural festival is in full swing. Tashiro is walking around with a suspicious grin, however, making Yoshi wonder what she and President Kamiya must be planning. He was then shocked to hear the voices of Akain at school and it looks like all of them truly had visited him at school. Yoshi introduces Akain, Ishiki, and haste to his classmates while the other Katabuki so residents are all over the school. Few cases in the art room, staring intently at students' paintings, Mariko is walking around the hallways, while the yakai landlord is taking photographs with children who thought that he is a school mascot. Mariko is helping random students cook their dishes while Sato is just enjoying the food. Meanwhile, Ishiki leaves to go to the literature club while Akain joins a food-eating contest, leaving Heis and Yoshi to wander around the booths together. They see Fukase going crazy painting and improving other people's artwork, and they pass by the literature club where Ishiki is swarmed all over by his fans. Meanwhile, Akain is decimating all her opponents in the food-eating contest. They also pass by Antiquary who set up a booth of his own to sell some artifacts and he offers them a crystal said to be the lightning of the gods. At the gym, the beauty pageant is in full swing and Mariko is on the stage amongst the contestants. Unfortunately for her, no one can even see her. The honest see the demon hunting game and they readily accept the challenge, but some schoolgirls mistake them as costumed students who push them towards the stage where they are used as target practice by children. Next, the time comes for the English Conversation Club's play and the others eagerly await Yoshi's performance. Unfortunately, Yoshi was in charge of creating the sound effects and lights, meaning he never entered the stage. Meanwhile, some delinquents are bored with the whole festival and annoyed that nothing fun is happening. They then overhear President Kamiya and Chayaki planning the next stage of the cultural festival at the gymnasium and they decide to have some mischievous fun of their own. When they all gather at the gymnasium for the next event, the electricity suddenly goes out. 
Yoshi and the others go to check on it and it looks like someone messed with the circuitry of the building. Yoshi can see the sad faces of President Kamiya and Tashiro since all their planning is going to be wasted so he wonders what he can do to help. At that moment, the other Katabuki so residents arrive to see what's the matter, and they offer to help. A few minutes later, the electricity is back on in the gymnasium and a Chad suddenly appears on the stage in front of a microphone. It turns out it was actually Chayaki sensei who suddenly starts giving the performance of a lifetime. Backstage, Actuary was using the crystal from earlier to conduct electricity through the broken circuitry, while the other yakais are Chayaki sensei's band. Yoshi uses the pati to create fireworks and lights inside the gym as well as rain confetti all over Chayaki's performance. After his energizing song, Chayaki suddenly shifts gears and starts serenading the audience with a mellow song. Yoshi even added a little rain over the Chayaki, making him sparkle under the spotlight. Meanwhile, the other delinquents are back to sabotage the electricity again, but unfortunately for them, this time it was guarded by Fukase, Ishiki, and Hase himself. After Chayaki's performance, he had earned back the absolute adoration of the students, just like how President Kamiya planned it. President Kamiya would have liked to thank Yoshi's friends but they already vanished, seemingly like ghosts. At the end of the festival, the others happily leave the event just in time for Furuhanya to arrive. Meanwhile, Chayaki sensei is once again surrounded by students, just like before. Later, Yoshi asks Chayaki how this all happened and it turns out Tashiro found a picture of him performing back when he was still at school. The president then went on her knees and begged Chayaki to sing at the culture fair, so he never had the chance to refuse. Chayaki remarks that it was actually rough at his old school too since everyone kept confessing to him after he sang. The worst part is he went to an all-boys school. Yoshi also noticed one last change at the school after the culture fair. Aoki sensei started ignoring them. It seems that she had just chosen to ignore the people she cannot control. Chayaki points out that there's nothing wrong with that. At least they get to see the human side of Aoki sensei. And so, Yoshi's second semester where he met two teachers, Chayaki and Aoki, ended all right. The year's coming to a close and it's Christmas season in Japan. For Yoshi, this means that it's the season for making money at work. Sasaki and Kawashima still work with Yoshi and this time, they are now the ones helping new part-timers with their work. Yoshi can't deny that his two former pupils are now fully grown. Later, Yoshi is delivering a package when he almost runs into a girl wearing a Santa costume. To his surprise, it was actually Yumi. George also greets him and it turns out that they were both invited to a party where they were chosen to be the Santas. As they leave, Yoshi is glad to see that Yumi is so friendly with George and his circle now. After delivering his package, Yoshi also notices someone he knows by an alley. It was Teknaka carrying some boxes. He was about to approach him when Teknaka's boss suddenly appears and gives Teknaka a cold can of coffee. Not wanting to bother Teknaka's break, Yoshi walks away, leaving Teknaka to choose his own destiny. The next person he encounters is Ariko. Ariko tells him that she's just shopping for Christmas and starts asking Yoshi why he won't be coming over for Christmas and New Year. Yoshi explains that he's just busy with work and he'll visit during summer break. Ariko looks annoyed and walks away confusing Yoshi more. On New Year's Eve, the people at Katabukiso are once again making Yoshi. This time, Hase is doing the pounding while Yoshi handles the rice. They then have a hot pot for dinner when all of a sudden, Namahijanis or New Year demons break into the room and demand to know who the naughty kids are. Furuhanya also arrives and they all share a drink and dinner inside the warm apartment while snow falls gently outside. When the clock strikes midnight, they all cheer for the New Year while Yoshi, Hase and Kiri watch the thin snow outside. Kiri wants to play in the snow but sadly, there wasn't enough snow to play in. That's when a kind chimes in that the landlord actually opened a hole to the snowy tundra next to the waterfall. They head downstairs to a cave under the waterfall and find themselves on a vast snowy plain. There, they start sliding around and having snowball fights. In the distance, they notice that an infinite number of snow huts seem to dot the landscape. Fool explains to them that it might be the snow huts of time. Legends say that if one enters, then one can see the past and future. This instantly piques their attention and they enter one of them. In a flash, they were transported somewhere and they watched Yoshi's first arrival at the Katabuki So. It looks like they really traveled to the past. Kiri unfortunately bumps into his past self and the whole future unravels. It turns out that when someone from the past realizes that they are from the future, they will be sent back to the tundra. Kiri runs to another snow hut and when they enter it, this time they are transported way back into the past in front of Oda Nobunaga, the great unifier of ancient Japan. Oda complains about how many time travelers seem to visit him and they immediately get sent back to the tundra. 
Yoshi decides that they should check the future next since he wants to see if his dream of working for the government comes true. They entered the snow hut and they were instantly transported to Las Vegas. Yoshi wonders what his future self might be doing in Las Vegas but then, they see that Yoshi is now a traveler accompanying Furuhanya. Furuhanya sees them and tries to borrow some money from them, making them return back to the tundra. Next, Hase now wants to see his own future. When they enter the snow hut, they find themselves in a high-rise building where a secretary reports to Hase all his scheduled meetings for today. Surprisingly, the secretary's voice seems weirdly familiar to Yoshi, and a few seconds later, he learns that it's actually Tashiro. Yoshi loudly complains how Heisa's dream seems to come true while his doesn't. His loud voice also alerts their future selves to their presence, making them return to the tundra. Yoshi enters another snow hut this time determined to see his ideal future. However, this future contains a Yoshi that is a famous author whose die-hard fan tries to kill him, just like Ishiki's fan did. The future disappears and weirdly enough, Yoshi and the others find themselves in front of the Yakai apartments. Fool explains that this probably isn't a future, but a parallel world. The house then abruptly opens its jaws wide and sucks them in, forcing them to fall into a dimensional rift. Fool expounds that they've been caught in the flow of time and if it continues, they will never be able to return to their world. Yoshi couldn't let this happen to Hase and Kiri so he pulls out the Petit Hyrazoican, and summons his familiars. First, he calls out Igni's Fadus, the sun, to light their path, and then Hippogriff, the chariot, to carry them. This time, the temperamental and proud bird let them ride her as she flies to the bright light and back to the tundra. Yoshi and Hayes hug as they celebrate surviving an otherwise fatal accident, and the others arrive after trying to look for them. They head to the hot springs to relax and Ryu commends Yoshi for saving Hayes and Kuri. Antiquary then remarks that what the snow huts show is not actually the future, but one of many possible futures. His choices still determine his future. Just as there were infinite snow huts, there are infinite possibilities for each of us. Hayes admits what he saw wasn't actually the future he wanted because he couldn't imagine a future without Yoshi. They all then watch the sunrise together with Mariko complaining that she forgot her towel partying in the new year alongside those he loves. That was the future Yoshi chose. At school, he happily greets Toshiro and Mr. Chayaki and sees that Yamamoto is also happy with Ms. Aoki. Since the start of his high school, Yoshi has made many choices and seen many different karmas. He wonders what the future might still hold for him and the thought of them just makes him more excited. Just as excited as the first day he came to the Yakai apartments. <laughs>